Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Subcontinent. The program aims to discuss the most significant issues in the subcontinent that affect the governments, communities, organizations and the region as a whole. And as usual, we will try to explore and explain its geopolitics, untangle the arguments from different perspectives and make the alternative voices heard. In this edition of The Subcontinent, we are going to take a look at America's disastrous legacy in Afghanistan and the consequences of 20-year-long U.S. military adventurism that plunged the war-ravaged country into unimaginable chaos. And we shall discuss how the U.S. longest war spawned terrorism, poverty, corruption, nepotism, warlordism and human rights abuses in Afghanistan. After splurging trillions of dollars to decimate the Taliban, causing death, destruction and displacement, as well as lying to American taxpayers about a disastrous war, U.S. President Joe Biden finally pulled the plug on the 20-year-long adventure but not before the country plunged into chaos. There are several things that were wrong for the U.S. that allies in Afghanistan, from failed strategy, unrealistic goals, systematic lying, hegemonic ambitions and failure to win the hearts and minds of people. Afghanistan has for a reason been the graveyard of empires. Americans invaded Afghanistan in 2001 following the devastating events of 9-11 to annihilate the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. On the paper, the goal was to capture Osama bin Laden, the former CIA ally and the alleged mastermind of 9-11 attacks. But in reality, then US President George Bush and his hawkish Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld wanted full-scale war. They saw it as an opportunity to militarily occupy the mineral-rich country lying at the crossroads of Central Asia and South Asia. I think the the biggest problem was that we did not have strategic focus at the beginning of this conflict. Um, You know, we had known since 1996 that uh, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda was a threat to the United States and uh, and and its allies, um, and yet from 1996 to 2001, um, we did not effectively deal with this threat. Um, even after two U.S. embassies were bombed in Africa, a U.S. naval vessel was bombed in a Yemeni port, uh, and and other um, uh, attacks were were made by Al Qaeda on U.S. interests. Um, and, and then when 9-11 occurred, the terrorist attacks on the United States in September 11, 2001, um, we, we didn't have a, a plan other than revenge. And revenge is never a plan. Revenge is never a strategy. Um, you know, we, instead of seeking to come up with the best solution to the problem of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, uh, we wanted blood. We wanted bodies. We wanted revenge. Our politicians needed to be able to look at the American people and say, we have killed people. We have punished people for the crimes that were perpetrated against us. And anytime you start a war um, with that mindset, uh, it's not going to go well because you will get distracted. You will get, um, you know, you will lose track of what you're doing. And this is what happened in Afghanistan. For the past 20 years, Americans splurged trillions of dollars and dispatched Black Hawks loaded with special commandos to Afghanistan. Contrary to what you hear, it was not done for nation building or promoting peace and democracy. The goal was to consolidate the military control over the landlocked country and make it subservient to the US. But the one thing successive regimes in Washington seemed to disregard was history. From the British in 1839 to the Americans in 2021, foreign powers have always faced defeat and disgrace in the strategically located country. What Americans face, though, will count as the worst strategic and military debacle of the last century. The way Taliban's much smaller ragtag army pummeled the world's most powerful military carries important lessons. 
It also bears testimony to America's inglorious legacy of humiliation, surrender and defeat in Afghanistan. The dramatic turn of events in the wake of Taliban's takeover of Kabul last week quite clearly demonstrate the failed U.S. foreign policy gambles and lessons unlearned from the such debacles in the past. But the decline and fall in Afghanistan did not unfold just last week. Every year, for the past two decades, desperate and hopeless Afghans have been fleeing their troubled homeland amid rising violence, insecurity, poverty, lawlessness and corruption. Americans not only failed to keep their promise of building the institutions of governance in Afghanistan, but they also spawned corruption, patronized warlords, emboldened militant groups and carried out horrendous war crimes. Neoconservative Americans and their NATO allies, who launched the war in Afghanistan and spent years defending it, are now busy playing blame games over last week's fiasco. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg blamed the Afghan government for Taliban's stunning takeover. Former UK Premier Tony Blair slammed Joe Biden for the imbecile pullout. Former US President Donald Trump fired salvos at both Biden and runaway Afghan President Ashraf Ghani. Biden's botched exit in Afghanistan is the most astonishing display of gross incompetence by a nation's leader. I've never been a big fan of Ghani. I always said he was a total crook. I've said it for years. Biden and his Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, in turn, washed their hands off the mess. What they refuse to acknowledge is that the debacle has been the result of their own missteps in the war-ravaged country. 20 years down the line, 90% of people in Afghanistan live below poverty line. National economy remains heavily dependent on foreign aid. The country continues to produce third highest number of refugees. There are also around 4 million internally displaced people. Institutions of governance and rule of law lie in shambles. A sizable population is addicted to opium and around 90% of its supply continues to flow from Afghanistan. Afghanistan remains one of the worst performing countries on the quality of life index. And more importantly, no Afghan sleeps in peace at night. That is the legacy of America's 20-year war in Afghanistan. 20 years on, has the US military occupation in Afghanistan brought peace and security? Has it stemmed the seamless exodus of Afghans? Have the incidents of violence and civilian casualties dropped? The answer is a resounding no. American presence all these years turned the country into a breeding ground for terrorism and organized crime, most of which was aided and abetted by Americans themselves. America will be remembered in Afghanistan for airstrikes, drone strikes, night raids, drug trafficking, corruption and regional instability. The stated objective of America's military intervention in Afghanistan in 2001 was to dismantle the sanctuaries of Taliban and al-Qaeda. After the mission was accomplished, the foreign invaders refused to quit. That effectively paved the way for Taliban's resurgence, which came in the backdrop of horrific war crimes by the US and NATO forces. One of the earliest heart-rending tragedies came in August 2008 when 91 innocent civilians, including 60 children and 16 women, were killed in the U.S. bombing of a small hamlet in western Herat province. The perpetrators got away with it. In 2015, around 40 people were killed in a U.S. airstrike that targeted a hospital in northern Kunduz province. They again got away with it. In between these two massacres, many other mass murders took place. The pandemic of impunity continued even as poor civilians vanished into thin air. Americans had the license to kill. Night raids also came to represent the most terrifying tactics of war in Afghanistan, like the incident in southeastern Paktia province in 2010, where five civilians, including two pregnant women, were killed. Any 
تو را شش سال هم دیگر مرد، یه دیگر مرد، خوب کردم مرد، خوب کاتل کردی. یکی امی زن بیادارم، یکی امی هم شری مگه دختر ازش. ای از دویش، یکیش چهار ماه، یکیش پنج ماه بیاد بیم. امی ندارد. Incidents like these made Afghans feel unsafe in their own homes. Custodial torture became another problematic part of American legacy in Afghanistan, as the International Criminal Court highlighted in its report in 2017. Americans also patronized and sponsored infamous warlords, drug traffickers and military contractors in the country, which only bred widespread distrust. Thus, the debacle of the U.S. and the comeback of the Taliban did not happen overnight. As U.S. Chinook helicopters rushed to evacuate American diplomats from the U.S. Embassy in Kabul last week, hours after Taliban lay siege to the city, it was a deja vu moment for many. Almost 46 years ago, the U.S. had airlifted its military and diplomatic figures out of Vietnam after Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese forces. Although Biden insisted that Kabul was not Saigon, the comparisons were natural. The images of a Chinook helicopter circling above the U.S. Embassy in Kabul underscored how Americans had failed to learn lessons from Saigon, repeating the same blunders and facing the same results. Both Afghanistan and Vietnam bear striking similarity in terms of the American legacy of lies. Pentagon Papers, the secret government documents published in 1971, illustrated how then U.S. President Lyndon Johnson systematically lied about the U.S. military operations in Vietnam. Almost 48 years on in 2019, Afghanistan papers published by the Washington Post disclosed the pattern of lies and obfuscations about America's war in Afghanistan. The biggest commonality is American hubris, the notion that we can come in and, uh, and we can dictate a solution. Uh, we tried that in Vietnam and we failed because it, once again we supported a corrupt government uh, that was operating against a legitimate um, you know, uh, popular resistance in the Viet Cong and a legitimate government in North Vietnam that was supporting the Viet Cong. Um, we were never going to win in South Vietnam. Uh, and in Afghanistan, the same thing. We came in and we removed the Taliban, but, you know, we kept treating the Taliban as if it were some sort of foreign entity instead of recognizing that the Taliban was an expression of Pashtun tribal reality, that they were Afghan. Um, and so you can't sit there and say, well, we're going to remove the Taliban because the Taliban is Afghanistan. It's an Afghan reality. Uh, and the fact that the Taliban survived 20 years of incessant warfare and emerged stronger today than they were in 2001 is proof positive that uh, many Afghan people support the Taliban, support what it represents. According to Afghanistan papers, statistics about massive losses suffered by Americans and their allies in Afghanistan were manipulated and warnings about the Taliban's resurgence were suppressed by the Pentagon to paint a rosy picture of the war, which translated into the biggest military debacle. It said the U.S. military had resorted to an old tactic from Vietnam in Afghanistan, manipulating public opinion. It didn't happen overnight. From George Bush to Joe Biden, all American presidents have been complicit in the catastrophic situation in Afghanistan, especially by perpetuating delusions about the unwinnable war. In 2015, a senior U.S. military general in Afghanistan went on record saying the U.S. forces were devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan, and they didn't have the foggiest notion of what they were undertaking. That happens when invaders lose the plot. The war in Afghanistan, like the war in Vietnam, was based on false premises and was bound to result in a disaster. Will Americans take lessons from it or repeat the same missteps somewhere else? Only time will tell. The only people that can hold the United States to account are the American people. And while I'm hopeful that the American people will look back on what has happened, be embarrassed by this and, and seek some sort of accounting of uh, a leadership, an American leadership that has lied to them for 20 years, it isn't going to happen. The American people were not vested in Afghanistan. We didn't lose enough American soldiers. I mean, 
you know, 2,400 is a lot, but not enough to make the American people care. Uh, tens of thousands of wounded is a lot, but not enough to make the American people care. Now to have more insights, we are joined by Mark Sloboda, an international relations and security analyst. Before we begin, I would like to welcome Mr. Sloboda to the program. Now, sir, Afghanistan is perhaps the worst strategic, diplomatic and military debacle of the last century. So what went wrong for the U.S. in its longest war? Well, the primary problem that the U.S. faced is an incompatibility of its means with its mission once they got on the ground. If the United States had restricted themselves to simply a counter-terrorism mission um, to um, uh, counter, defeat, strike the uh, Al-Qaeda network in Afghanistan, which was their original and primary rhetorical target, uh, then they probably would have had a great deal of success. Uh, but instead, um, the uh, George W. Bush administration envisioned their mission in Afghanistan um, as an invasion, a military occupation, and a reorganization of Afghani society and culture along American lines, which is to say nation building. And where they failed is a nation building mission. They failed to, to win or to change the hearts and minds of the Afghan people uh, to accept a uh, US light installed political uh, system and society on them. And uh, the every single US nation built mission uh, in uh, you know the last few decades has failed and Afghanistan uh, the, the longest standing one with the most money invested uh, nonetheless uh, failed more spectacularly even uh, than its others. Sir, as we know, the Americans invaded Afghanistan in 2001 on the pretext of the so-called war on terror, but 20 years down the line, they have shamelessly retreated. Now, how do you see the U.S. legacy in the war-ravaged country? Well, the legacy of the United States in the country of Afghanistan will, of course, uh, not be a good one. Um, there have been lots of problems uh, with the U.S. military occupation of Afghanistan, war crimes, U.S. soldiers hunting Afghan for trophies, torture, uh, the like, uh, you know, which mar its most, you know, uh, immediate legacy. The uh, failure of the United States to build infrastructure, institutions, schools, um, actually place a lot of Afghans as remembering uh, the Soviet occupation uh, uh, during the Soviet intervention uh, in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, more favorably um, because of, of what the Soviet Union you know, left in its place. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is leaving mostly behind military equipment of a light counter-terrorism nature. Um, and with the United States itself having spent some, depending on your account, some two to three trillion dollars uh, of its own taxpayers' money um, on a uh, essentially completely failed uh, nation-building mission with uh, very little left to show for it. Mr. Sloboda, with the Americans retreating from the graveyard of empires after 20 marathon years, shouldn't they be held accountable for wreaking havoc in the country? Should the United States be held accountable for its crimes uh, in Afghanistan? The U.S., in the pursuit of this mission, con committed numerous uh, war crimes uh, against uh, the Afghan people. Should it be held accountable for these uh, and for its acts of, of aggression? Uh, yes, absolutely. Will it be? No. Absolutely not. The United States is a member of the UN Security Council, uh, two, a permanent member. Uh, two of its partner 
There's uh, four. It's a military occupation of Afghanistan. The United Kingdom and France are also permanent members of the Security Council. And currently, under international law, there really exists uh, no mechanism to hold a permanent member of the Security Council accountable because of their veto power um, over, uh, you know, uh, not only the International Criminal Court uh, but the UN Security Council itself. So they will ultimately not be. The only hope for that is the Court of American Public Opinion, and unfortunately that is even less likely. One last question, sir. Now with Taliban firmly in control, do you see any role for the U.S. in Afghanistan from now on? Well, the the Taliban is not firmly in control of Afghanistan. First of all, there does uh, remain some political and possibly military resistance in the Panjshir Valley. Uh, and this is centered around the figures of the, uh, until recently, uh, U.S. installed uh, regime vice president Saleh, who is a figure who has uh, worked uh, closely with the Central Intelligence Agency uh, in the past. Um, and uh, the uh, figure uh, Ahmed Massoud, um, whom, uh, of course, is the son of his famous uh, Jamiriyat uh, father. Um, and he um, is being used as a, a figurehead uh, by uh, those who seek some type of uh, military resistance uh, in northern Afghanistan, uh, you know, to echo uh, the long northern alliance resistance uh, to the Taliban 1.0. But perhaps, ultimately, the further U.S. role in Afghanistan will be one of spoiler. If they can't control the country, they will make sure that they economically strangle the Taliban, and so doing will try to destabilize the country. Once again, because they fear that Russia and China and Iran, uh, uh, seeking stability uh, in the region, Uh, and a a pathway for uh, the Belt and Road and other economic initiatives, um, you know, will uh, move into the country. That, of course, does not mean militarily, uh, but it means trying to shore up, uh, you know, a new Taliban government economically. The U.S. will attempt to strangle that uh, with sanctions, with control of the IMF. They've already frozen uh, the uh, Afghan state's uh, international reserves, currency uh, reserves, um, and they will do everything possible to uh, strangle uh, the economy of an Afghanistan um ruled by the Taliban in an attempt to continue to destabilize the situation. If they can't control it, they will want it destabilized uh, for the surrounding Eurasian powers. Mr. Sloboda, thank you for your precious time and knowledge. Now, let's see how the people have reacted on social media and cyberspace on the turn of events in war-ravaged Afghanistan and the disastrous U.S. legacy. U.S.-based historian and podcaster Ali Olumi says Taliban took advantage of the system built by the U.S. in Afghanistan, based on corruption, bribes and payoffs. Ben Norton, a journalist and filmmaker based in Latin America, notes that Americans were not in Afghanistan for nation-building, but to exploit its rich mineral resources. European Parliament Mick Wallace asserts that the U.S. NATO project in Afghanistan was designed to enrich the military-industrial complex at the cost to Afghans. American journalist Kurt Millis quotes from an article by a former U.S. Marine in which he accuses the U.S. politicians, elites and military leaders of lying about Afghanistan for 20 years. Hu Shi Jin, a Chinese journalist, notes that defeat in Vietnam buried the American leadership and Kabul did it again, warning that Asia will turn into super graveyard of the U.S. empire. And that was our episode on the ignominious end to America's longest war in Afghanistan and the disastrous legacy it leaves in the war-ravaged country after 20 long years of military occupation. 
To watch a melange of the best bits and pieces of our show and more subcontinental updates, follow us on social media platforms and don't forget to give us your feedback. We shall meet again, same time, same day, next week. So till then, take care.